Good morning. Good morning. The Lord be with you. And also with you. A special word of greeting to those who join us by cable and with the internet. We're certainly delighted to welcome you to our moments of worship. We trust the worship for you will be a blessing and inspiration. If you're new to our community or if you're looking for a local church home, we prayerfully encourage your visit and your worship with our church family. Now let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the beauty and the wonder of this world you created. You are the creator of earth and all of its resources, so we pray for the spiritual wisdom and understanding to protect it. We give you thanks for the wonder and the beauty of our bodies created in your image. As you took on human flesh in the person of your son, Jesus, you taught us through his healing and feeding that all life is sacred. Remind us to care for ourselves and for the lives of others. We praise you for the life we enjoy in this world and the resurrection hope into the next life promised through him. Father, who is above us and below us, before us and within us, we come now with our prayers, lying, all bare, lying bare all our hopes and fears. Hear us as we pray. We ask for the healing for those who are sick. You alone are the source of healing that comes through doctors and nurses, caregivers and medicines. We pray for those who endure violence in homes, cities, and nations. God, soften, our, soften the hearts of those who choose weapons instead of words that can lead to reconciliation and peace. We pray particularly for the people in the Middle East, Ukraine, Syria, and all places where terror exists. We ask you to mend the hearts of those who grieve the loss of loved ones, those whose families are torn, and those whose dreams are constant struggles. Let your grace bear witness to them. Lord, we pray for this church and our witness to the world as the body of Christ. We give you thanks for those who came before us, their vision and commitment to welcome all who seek to know you through Christ. We ask you bless this congregation and courage to proclaim the good news, inspire future generations, and boldly step into the future becoming all of what you ordain. God in you is a greater power than we can ever imagine. Hear our prayers for your people and hear us as we pray in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, power, and glory. Good morning. How are y'all? Y'all good? Can you slide over just a little bit? Thank you. I'm going to stand up, though, because I've got to do something. Hey, Emmy. And I need to stand up to do it. Uh, what have I got here? It's just what? A yellow piece of paper? I'm going to show y'all a trick. I'm going to show you some magic. Haley, will you come here just a second? I'm going to get Haley to hold this microphone just a minute. <coughs> okay. I'm going to make a magic airplane. airplane has an extra wing somewhere at the end of it. Now, how far do you think an airplane will fly? Oh, well, I think it'll go like even up above the clouds. Do you think it can go to heaven? Do you think we can go to, air, to heaven on an airplane? No, I don't think it'll go all the way to heaven. But how about get to heaven in a rocket? I mean, it can go to the moon. It can go to another planet. No. Nothing we make on earth, nothing we build can get us to heaven. But what can get us to heaven is through what Jesus did for us on the cross. Well, that is cool. Jesus died for us on the cross. He died for our sins. And a sin is when we do something wrong. And it sounds like a sad story that Jesus had to die, but really it's the greatest story of all 
Because God knew, even before we were born, that we would make wrong decisions and we would do wrong things. Even mommies and daddies, Sharon does wrong things. And God sent Jesus to die for our sins. And when we ask God to forgive us, and we really, really, really mean it, and we're really sorry, then God not only forgives us, but guess what? He forgets all about the wrong thing we did. That is cool, huh? So next time you do something wrong, ask God to forgive you and tell Jesus you're sorry, and God will forgive you, okay? So let's say a little prayer. Dear God, thank you for loving us, for your son Jesus, and for always forgiving us when we make a wrong decision. Amen.
thank the ladies of heart and soul for our inspiring special music and most especially this timely reminder of our need to be still, silent, sensitive, and responsive to the very presence of God. A special word of thanks to Mr. Jeff Beamer for his splendid assistance in our worship this morning. The reading of scripture is taken from the New Testament, from the fourth gospel, the gospel of John, chapter 10, verses 7 through 18. As you're able, if you would please stand for the reading of God's word. Let us now hear the word of God. So again, Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and bandits, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may find life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me just as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the father loves me because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. This is the word of God for the people of God. Let's be to God. Let's bow together for a moment of prayer. Eternal God, in our moments of worship, we instinctively, in the exercise of our faith, seek your face, your word, your will, your love. So, Father, in these moments, speak to us through the written word and through him who is the living word. And, Father, then, following our worship, may we speak to our world with those same words with which we've been addressed so that, Father, the church beyond these walls might be that very presence and body of Christ to bring hope and help and encouragement and salvation to a world in such dire need. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Plato, who was perhaps the greatest of all the ancient Greek philosophers, once gathered his students together. And on that occasion, he said to them, there are three fundamental questions which concern all humanity. The first question, where did I come from? The second question, what am I here for? And the third question, where am I going? Then Plato added, those who have found the answer to these questions will have found life. The tragedy, however, is that many who have been able to formulate answers to these philosophical questions have still not found life. Indeed, it's possible to fill our heads with knowledge and theories and propositions, and yet our hearts and our souls be completely empty. In our scripture lesson, the Lord Jesus said that he had come to give life. He had come to give life and life more abundantly. The premise of the Christian gospel is that Jesus of Nazareth came not to answer the academic questions of life, nor to solve the problems and perplexities of life. Rather, the Lord Jesus came into our world to give life, to give that quality of life which is abundant and full. This abundant life of which Jesus spoke 
and to which the scriptures give record has at least four distinct dimensions. First of all, I submit, abundant life has depth. Abundant life has deep and solid foundations upon which to stand. These foundations have stood the test of time. These foundations go beyond the mere surface and superficiality of life. Indeed, the deep and solid foundations of abundant life provide us security and stability. As we well know, the human search for meaning and security is as old as humankind itself. Historically, that quest began when Adam, mankind, sinned and thus found itself estranged from God. After being banished from the garden, humankind began to search for something upon which to stand, something solid and substantial, something which would support him and his endeavors. And through the generations and through the millennia, humankind has looked everywhere for someone or something greater and stronger than himself, someone or something to which we might attach ourselves. So it is our search for meaning has gone through the realms of science, education, technology, business, politics, and pleasure. In all of these various avenues of quest, we're searching for value, for meaning, for worth. We're searching for foundations which will give support to our lives and to our living. Sadly, though, most of us in our human quest have found only the shifting sands and not the solid rock. I would submit that there are at least three or more perspectives current today across our humanity that gives insight as to the people's quest for value, meaning, and purpose. First, I suggest the Judas perspective. You remember that Judas was one of the 12 apostles. He was intelligent well educated for his day and apparently he was trustworthy he was elected by the early apostles as their treasurer early in Judas's relationship with Jesus he heard this itinerant preacher mention kingdoms and messiahships he heard Jesus talk about masters and lords and power it's apparent that Judas was interested in power and prominence and recognition and so he attached himself to this itinerant preacher. And for the next few years, he followed Jesus, observing and helping, but increasingly becoming more and more disillusioned. Judas looked upon the itinerant preacher Jesus as a power broker, as a way for him to gain power and prominence. Increasingly, though, Judas realized that instead of being a power broker, Jesus of Nazareth was a suffering servant. Instead of talking about wealth and prestige and popularity and possessions, Jesus spoke about sacrifice and servanthood and service, even unto the least and last of our fellow strugglers. And so at a pivotal point, Judas decided that he would break away from Jesus, but he would not leave this arrangement without some personal gain. And so to the Sanhedrin, the Supreme Court of Judaism, Judas went and negotiated a sale. It's significant that the agreed upon price for him betraying the Son of God was 30 pieces of silver, the very price in that day for a male slave. Judas would exchange the eternal for the expedient. And as we well know, following his bargain as such, he had such fatal regrets that he could no longer tolerate himself and thus he took his life. There are those today in our modern culture who embrace the prodigal perspective. You remember that most famous of all the parables of Jesus. A father had two sons. The younger son one day came to his dad and said, I want what will be mine when you die. I want it now. And in that ancient day, primogeniture dictated that the father's estate would be divided in this, way, in this way. The eldest son 
would receive two-thirds of the father's property. Other sons, regardless of the number, would divide the remaining one-third. And so the younger son was saying to his dad, I want my one-third of your estate now. And surprisingly, the father agreed and gave to that younger son one-third enormous wealth to this teenage boy. And the younger son envisioned a life in the distant country where there were few responsibilities, no supervision. And so he went into that far country. And the Bible says he wasted his inheritance in riotous living when all the money had been spent his so-called friends had deserted him and in a pigsty he began to think seriously and soberly about himself and his life and Jesus said he came to himself and in that coming to self a work of God's spirit he determined he would go back home and repent asking to be a slave no longer a son those who embrace the prodigal perspective assume that life is greener elsewhere and that life should be lived with pleasure, with little thought of responsibility or accountability. And so like the prodigal son, there are many today who exchange their hereafter for the here and now, and especially for the pleasures, the hedonism that is so generously offered in our world. And for those who embrace this lifestyle, who pursue this perspective, they may fleetingly catch a pleasure but once in their hands, it's much like cotton candy or ocean foam. And then a third perspective also lifted from the scripture. It is the rich fool perspective. This wealthy farmer had just gathered his latest harvest. And as he took note of the abundance of his harvest, he thought, my barns are inadequate. I will build greater and bigger barns. And so he set in motion that strategy. And during the planning of what he would do with such a surplus of harvest, he said, so you've got ample goods laid up for many years. You can now take your ease. You can eat, drink, and be merry. You've got it made. Never once considering his mortality nor his accountability to the God of heaven and earth. And that very night in all of his selfish, self-centered plans, God himself said to the rich farmer, You fool! Tonight your soul is taken from you. And all these things that you call yours, to whom will they be left? There are those today who think that life should be supported and sustained by property and possessions and acquisitions and stuff. But things were never intended to be a foundation for life. Things that we call ours or ill-equipped to support and to sustain us. And especially in those dark nights of the soul. When those things are looked upon as foundations, they crumble. They erode. And we find ourselves lacking much like the rich farmer. Jesus said there are two things we can do. One of two things, he said. You can build the house of your life on sand, and many do. And when our house is built on the sand, and the storms come and the floods wash, our house is easily destroyed. But if we build the house of our life on the rock, on a solid foundation, when the storms come, and they certainly do, then in the midst of those onsets of storm and wind and wave, the house of our life will stand. Why? Because it's built on a trustworthy foundation, even God himself. Yes, this quality of life of which Jesus spoke, this abundant life, has depth because it is founded not on self nor on our resources. Rather, it is built and established on him who is the solid rock. But also this life which is abundant has height. Abundant life has fellowship. It has communion with God. Within every human heart, brothers and sisters, there is that innate eternal instinct 
to reach out and above and beyond ourselves. It is inevitable within every person because we're made in the image of God, because God is creator and we are the creation. Instinctively, inevitably, we reach up and away from ourselves to connect, to connect with Him who is creator and redeemer, but also as a part of this inevitable impulse to stand up, even to stand on tiptoe. There is that desire deep within to realize our full potential. There is that craving, that thirst to be more than we are. To realize that potential, those possibilities, not in self, but in that one to whom we look. There is this desire, this impulse, because in our sober, more reflective, introspective moments, we realize we are more than just flesh and blood. We're more than just a creature like other creatures. As the human creature, we're made in God's image. We're fashioned after His likeness. The Bible says we're made just a little lower than the angels. The Bible says as humans, we're wonderfully and fearfully made. We have in us a mixture of dirt and deity. So it is the human lives forever. The human soul is immortal and eternal. This body in which we live is mortal, it's finite, it's fixed, it's weak. And in the words of Scripture, one day this tabernacle, this body goes back to the dust from which it came, but the soul, the person you are, lives and lives and lives forever. So it was the Apostle Paul said to the church in Colossae, If then you, the church, have been raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things on earth. A constant discipline for us in the exercise of our faith is that we look up. We keep our minds and our hearts and our faith fastened on God, His Word, His will, His way. Our human tendency is to focus our sights on things below. And it's because we are too focused on worldly things, on earthly things, that at times we become estranged from God and we begin to sense that God does not care for us, that God has abandoned us. In medieval times, there was a popular form of punishment. If a man broke the law, he was sentenced to several months or maybe many years, and he was put into a dungeon cell that had a low ceiling. The consequence of that was the man could not stand. He could not stretch. He could not lift his arms. He was sentenced and doomed to a cell that in essence crippled and cramped him. It caused him to live in that cell a stooped life. In much the same way there are people today because of poor choices, unwise decisions, sentenced themselves to a dwarfed existence. Indeed, when we touch and handle unholy, unclean things, we diminish our soul. Our soul becomes more and more enslaved by Satan and self and sin. Christ has come to give us life, not just mere existence. Christ has come to enable us to live, to live abundantly, not merely to exist. You and I know the vital difference between living and just existing I would suggest that a majority of our fellow strugglers, neighbors, friends, work associates, if they're truly honest, look upon their existence as just a day-by-day -day formality. Little joy, peace, gladness, serenity, tranquility. We have become a people so impacted by stress and pressure and anxiety and worry. And all of those factors diminish. They adversely affect our quality of life. And our being able to live, to live one day at a time, trusting God. 
putting our faith in His Word, knowing that God is honorable and trustworthy. And if we do our part, how small it might be, God will do His part. In arithmetic, as in life, there is a minus sign as well as a plus sign. You see, there are certain deeds, attitudes, and behavior that take away value from us. And most of that we do to ourselves. These minus signs confront us. And if we aren't alert and discerning without thinking about it, we engage. We begin to practice those minuses that over the hall take their toll on us, not only physically, but also spiritually. Lest we forget, Jesus said, only the pure in heart shall see God. It's only in Christ that we're able to stand up, to stretch, to live on tiptoe. Yes, this abundant life has depth. It also has height. Thirdly, the abundant life has breadth or width. Abundant life has distance from side to side. Abundant life is always inclusive and comprehensive. Abundant life is concerned not only with our relationship with God, a vertical relationship, but also with our relationship with our fellow man, our fellow struggler. Thus, our relationships horizontally. The Christian gospel has application for our relationship with God, the most important. But then secondly, our relationship with each other. In the practice of our faith, these two relationships intersect. And what is the sign of that intersection? A cross. When we truly love and worship and serve the Lord our God, the expressions of that relationship are seen horizontally and socially. Jesus is concerned not only about that upon which we stand, but also he's concerned about our outreach, our influence upon others. It's no accident that the church is called the body of Christ. It's no accident that we are told we are the continuing incarnation of Christ in this world. Jesus stayed very little at the temple or at the synagogue. He was down at the shore, at the marketplace, in the cemetery, in the village, in the city. Most of his time was spent with people. He was there rubbing shoulders. And the Bible says he went about doing good. Not in any calculated sense, but as the natural expression of who and whose he was. So are we called to be redemptive witnesses, effective influences for the gospel. It is said of the apostle Peter that he was so close to the Lord and the power of God was so upon him that even as he walked through the streets of Jerusalem, people would bring their sick, those infirmed, so that as Peter walked from place to place, his shadow might fall upon their sick bodies and thus the influence of his shadow would be a means of their healing. What about your shadow? All of us cast a shadow. Hopefully the shadows we cast in the lives we live are for good and for the kingdom of God. Abundant life has width. It always reaches out to others, not in condemnation, not in complaint, not in criticism, but in agape love. That love which is unconditional, that love which is sacrificial, that love which is self-giving. And as you've heard me say before from this sacred desk, God's love, agape, is not so much an emotion. It's not a feeling. It's not even affection. Agape is more a verb. It is doing. It is a deed, an action. It is something that reaches out and touches and helps and lifts up and makes a difference. Oh, that if we could ever be consumed by this godly love, especially in the world, what a difference it would make, not just to us, but to our community and to our society. This agape love is demonstrated toward the whole world. And thus John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world, cosmos, that he gave, he gave his very best, his only son. He gave that son to die on a Roman cross so that if anyone 
should believe in that son, he would never perish but have eternal life. And then in 1 John 3.16, the writer has says, By this we know agape, that Jesus laid down his life for us. And then John says, And so, brothers and sisters, we ought to do the same for others. To be willing to share, to give our lives in ministry, in witness, in servanthood to others. God's love leaves no one out. His love is especially concerned for the least and the last of our humanity. Look at the cross. It demonstrates vividly how wide and how much God loves all of us. And as I said this morning in early worship, as hard as it is to fathom, God loves those terrorists of ISIS who are killing in such brutal barbaric savage ways one of our good men said after the early worship Dr. Bob I know it's true but it's hard to understand and indeed it is it is beyond the realm of our reason our rationality but such is faith we can't understand it we can't explain it we can't fathom the mystery of it but God's love embraces the worst and most brutal people on planet earth and as brother Jeff mentioned in our prayer this morning we need to pray especially for the Middle East and for Israel and for the Ukraine where there is such injustice and inhumane treatment even the butchery of pregnant women if our lives are empty and restless and miserable, it's not because God doesn't love us. It's because we've not opened our hearts to Him, letting His love touch and melt and redeem our undoneness. Yes, God's love is for the whole world. And of all the peoples of the earth, He calls us the church to express that love. And then fourthly, abundant life has length. The abundant life which Christ came to bring, to give, begins here and now. And it never ends. It transcends death. It begins at the moment of our conversion. When by faith we receive Christ as Lord and Savior. It starts here and now. It transcends death. It culminates in heaven, in glory. In Christ, we have that glorious assurance that beyond this temporal, finite world, there is an infinite, eternal world. That world is referred to most often as heaven. It's also called the eternal city. It is that city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. It is also described by Jesus as being the Father's house in which there are several rooms and even mansions. Beloved, that is our home. That is our destiny. Here we are not citizens. As Christians, we are pilgrims. We're aliens. We're strangers. And we become so comfortable and cozy in this life, in this world. Any thought of heaven is diminished. We're not called to settle in and be comfortable here, but to maintain our mission to be in step with Jesus, going through this world en route to our destination, our eternal home. As the good shepherd, Jesus leads us down the roads and avenues of our earthly journey. And then one day, into and through the gates of death, at last, in our journey, Christ will lead us into that indescribable city, that city of splendor. It is that city which God has prepared for us who know and love and serve him. In his farewell discourse from John 14, Jesus says, I go away, but I'm coming back. I'm coming back because I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I prepare that place for you, I'll come and take you to myself so that where I am there, you can be with me. All of us have loved ones and friends who are there 
they have finished their journey. They now constitute that great cloud of witnesses who encourage us, who inspire us, who remind us that life is not always easy. And that if we're truly serious about our faith, there will be those negative reactions. They were faithful. Again, in Jeff's prayer, he expressed gratitude to God for those who have come before us and were faithful. Oh, that we would too be found faithful in the handling of our faith. One day, on the other side of this life, when you stand before God and His throne, the angels there will gather and they'll be welcoming you. Will the angels say, look, see how much like Jesus He is. See how much like the Savior She is. But also, dear friends, if we truly live abundantly here, We'll hear people here say much the same about us. See how much like Jesus they are. That's my hope and my prayer for our church. That this church will be noted and known as a church who are so much like the Lord Jesus. Not just on Sunday morning, but scattered through the week making a difference. Pouring help and hope into hearts and homes. Toward that end, God help us to live abundantly in all four of these dimensions. And the life that we begin here continues transcending death, being fully sanctified and glorified in the very presence of God. Just as we were born into this world through the womb of our mother, it is through the mystery of the womb of death that we're delivered unto our eternal destiny. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.